Um, based on the arbitrary deadline that the Senate Republicans are currently uh, talking about sticking to, we're in the last day of the special session. Uh, this is a choice, however. This is not necessary that it be the last day of the special session. <clears throat> we came into this special session looking to find as many agreements with Republicans as we could. There are four important areas we have to take action on. Uh, the first one is COVID-19. We are still in a pandemic. There is still an emergency afflicting many parts of our state operations. Second, we have important unfinished business from the regular session. The COVID-19 pandemic interrupted the regular session. Third, we have to do something on police accountability and reform. The tragic murder of George Floyd on May 25th changed the entire legislative agenda. There is no way for us to look away from this injustice and to not do the work that thousands of Minnesotans and, and millions of people around the world are demanding that governments take up. And the fourth thing we have to do is we have to take care of the economic devastation in Minneapolis and St. Paul and other affected communities that followed the civil unrest after George Floyd's murder. There is no reason to leave before the work is done. I really focus on keeping things productive and, and a positive working relationship. And uh, I don't engage in unnecessary attacks. I try to stick to the topics. Um, but I am really looking for willing participants on the Republican side of the aisle to come to the table and agree to take the time that we need to take to get agreements. It is the easiest thing in the world to walk away and to say, let's take it to the election. That is the easy out for politicians. No, let's not stay here and do the work. Let's not work through our disagreement. Let's say what we stand for and we'll take it to the election. When we take things to the election, we flush time down the toilet. Time that Minnesotans don't have. They need us to address COVID-19 right now. They need us to agree on a bonding bill right now. They need police reform and accountability right now. In fact, they needed it years ago. And the people in Minneapolis and St. Paul who had their buildings burned down through no fault of their own deserve for us to act right now. At the very least, Republicans should stay until midnight, the, the deadline that they themselves created, and work with us to get every single thing we possibly can get done, done. If they would just stay a few more days, we could get some amazing things done. We heard on the House floor yesterday, House Republicans really want to engage. They, Republicans really want to do something on police reform and accountability. Uh, Democrats really want to do something on police reform and accountability. We have to go to a table and we have to negotiate. And negotiations entail give and take. Uh, negotiations aren't, here's a list of the things that we're willing to accept. See you later if you don't do it the way we want to do it. Minnesotans deserve more from us. Uh, I really hope that the Senate will change its mind, the Senate Republican leadership will change its mind and decide to stay here in St. Paul until the work is done. This work is too important to walk away from right now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Majority Leader Winkler. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, as I sit in my office at the, in the Capitol building, I look out over the front lawn and there really is nobody out there. And the concern I have is that people have turned out on the streets by the tens of thousands to demand change, but they don't come to the state capitol in St. Paul, perhaps because they don't think that we are capable of making a difference in their lives. They don't look for us for solutions, they're looking at other places. And fundamentally, the state legislature is where the most meaningful change can happen on police accountability on reform, and reform, on rebuilding communities, on making sure that rural communities get investments that will help them make it through the COVID pandemic, uh, help pay for childcare, help support veterans, and so many things that are on the table today. And of course, we can't disregard the fact that we've had two bonding sessions in a row, the regular session this year, the regular session last year, where we couldn't build projects for communities around the state and put people to work, frankly, because House Republicans were unwilling to come to the table and negotiate in, in good faith with us to get that done. So 
we are at a point this summer where the need is high around the state, where the expectations for action are great in Minnesota, but very few people are at the state capitol, and I think it's because they are concerned that we, or don't think that we can provide the solutions. We can, they are on the table. And just a few days from Senate Republicans being willing to stay and negotiate could make an enormous difference. If they're willing to stick around, we can start making progress on a lot of bills and where we have a lot of agreement. That then creates the momentum for us to be able to tackle the issues where we still need to make progress, but we have bigger disagreements. But walking away today, uh, uh, following through on this self-imposed deadline that has no meaning whatsoever other than creating an artificial deadline would really be selling us short. I'd be selling Minnesota short. And the House has come forward with major legislation that we have really worked hard to prepare. Our members have been dedicated in the last uh, a week, frankly, to uh, get bills through committee in rapid order, have robust discussion, meaningful public input, and have really, really put their sweat, blood, and tears into getting these bills ready to meet an artificial de deadline from the Senate. It's time for the Senate to come to the table in good faith like we have and help us move this forward. And with that, I will turn it over to Leader Kent. Thank you, uh, Representative Winkler. Good afternoon, everyone. As we have all heard today, Senate Republicans plan to adjourn the Senate. And unfortunately, it is just too soon to go home. Uh, on the Senate side, we have not finished our work yet. And it's impossible to see how we're gonna get it done before this uh, arbitrary deadline of what has been described as midnight tonight. Um, there is, as you've heard, urgent and immediate work in front of us, like the need for a robust bonding bill that has gone through a very public process and is in, we think, very final stages of negotiation. And we know we need meaningful criminal justice reforms urgently. I am here to say that Senate DFLers very much want to stay in session and are asking to stay in session to get our work done. There is no reason that we need to adjourn today. There's nothing stopping us from continuing to do the work for as many days as are needed, other than this arbitrary deadline from Senate Republicans. And as I look at this, I keep thinking about, you know, how we often end budget years. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, a constitutionally mandated deadline and we get pushed up against that, but we know we're getting close. So we stick around and we do the work to finish up the work of the people of Minnesota. And we believe that is what needs to happen here. There is momentum, there is progress, and to walk away right now is not going to help us get the work done we need to do. Um, and worse yet, for the past two days, there hasn't been a single hearing nor session. That is valuable time we could have spent working out a robust bonding bill through committee hearings or holding hearings on the rest of the Posse Caucus criminal justice package. This, quite frankly, has been the special session in a nutshell. Republicans publicly offer lip service on their willingness to work with us, but then they ignore our emails, our phone calls, and ultimately the public process when it comes to doing the actual work. We saw this happen with our Senate members of the Posse Caucus and the Republican criminal justice reform bills. We've seen this with how they've completely shut Senate DFLers out of the process on a bonding bill. It is the last day of the special session, and they have yet to show us a bonding proposal. As Speaker Horman mentioned before, Minnesotans pay our salaries year round, and they rightly expect us to do our work. Just because this work is hard and time consuming isn't an excuse not to do it. I really believe that's what we all signed up to do, and that's our obligation to the people of Minnesota. Today, as people across the state and nation recognize and observe Juneteenth, Senate Republicans are sending a loud message by choosing to pack up and leave before we finish the work that Minnesotans are expecting us to do. Black, indigenous, and people of color have spent years fighting for justice. We can spend a little more than a week doing the same. The least we can do as elected officials is pass meaningful legislation that actually holds institutions accountable and bring justice to the black community and communities of color across the state. If we need to stay for more than a week to do that work well, then it is absolutely our job to do so. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. So the first question that we have here is from Kevin Featherly. Uh, in the spirit of give and take, what are you willing to give up in the police accountability bill to get it passed, if anything? I am not going to negotiate uh, Chair Mariani and Chair Moran's bill. 
But we did what is the normal thing that people do in the legislature, just little schoolhouse rock. In order for a bill to become a law, it has to pass through the House and the Senate. And if there are differences, it has to go to a conference committee. And then those differences are resolved. It gets repassed in the House and the Senate. The Senate sent us a bill we found unacceptable and incomplete on police reform and accountability, and we put our version on. Now, the normal thing that happens in legislatures around the globe is if the Senate doesn't agree, they can refuse to concur, and that bill will go to conference. And in that conference committee, Chair Moran, Chair Mariani, Chair Limmer, Democrats in the Senate, Republicans in the House can work out the differences. You know, the irony there is that on Tuesday, before the Senate decided to go in and start firing missiles at the House, the, we were trying to, there was a meeting set up for the criminal justice reform leaders. And you know why the senators couldn't go? Because they had to return to their regularly scheduled missile launch. Uh, that was a choice. Uh, they did not need to go to the Senate floor, pass bills that they hadn't had time to talk to their Senate DFL colleagues about, uh, pass bills that they had wholly inadequate engagement with the public on, and, and to literally walk away from the negotiating table. And then the next question we have here is from Stephen Joyce. His question is, if the state Senate adjourns without passing meaningful legislation on police reform, how will this affect the state elections in November? There's a whole lot of time between now and the elections. I'll let Senator Kent take that, but uh, boy, it doesn't look good. You know, when I listen to members of my caucus, um, what I know is that we have all seen a change in communities uh, around the state. Um, George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis has, has, has made a difference um, that I think has um, uh, resonated with all of us in a, a deep and profound way. Um, I don't want to put this in the context of elections. I want to talk about listening to the people of Minnesota. And the people of Minnesota saw something that is very wrong and they understand it fundamentally needs to be fixed. And while the Senate Republicans offered some bills that they wrote up by themselves um, without consulting with any stakeholders and certainly not without consulting any of the people of color in the Minnesota Senate, um, they don't go far enough. And we understand you can ban chokeholds all you want. They've been banned in communities around the country and around our own state. But until you have actual consequences and accountability, it doesn't make a difference, really. And that's what we're looking for, is something that makes a difference. And that's what the people in Minnesota are looking for. And I believe that the Senate Republicans are um, judging this wrong if they think they can just walk away from this today and in the long run and not feel like there's going to be a response from the people of Minnesota. And our next question is from Shannon. She said, Senator Gazelka said the House broke the deal on the federal stimulus money for local governments by amending it to include supplemental spending. Why make that choice? Well, first of all, the question assumes facts, not in evidence. We had a deal, all right. The four leaders had a deal. And the deal was to address COVID-19 related matters and unfinished business from the regular session. Uh, the, the matters that were taken up on Friday were fully agreed to by the four leaders. Uh, Senator Kent and I understood that Republicans uh, felt that they had no choice but to have a knockdown drag out on the governor's emergency executive powers. And uh, the deal <laughs> was broken by Senate Republicans when they decided on Tuesday to, instead of proceeding under the way we had been proceeding, uh, pursuant to agreement of all four leaders of what was coming up on each of the floors and uh, an agreement to let each other know which bills we were sending and work together on those bills, the Senate decided to start firing missiles. So there certainly was a deal on how the local government get aid would be allocated. That deal was completely fulfilled, but that was part of a larger set of discussions on unfinished business from the regular session. And when the Senate decided to push across the table a list of demands to the House, and not engage in negotiations, they are the individuals who walked away from the deal and who walked away from negotiations. And the next question is from- and Jessica, if I can just jump in on that really quickly, I just wanna, I just wanna um, reinforce what the speaker said because I was part of those conversations. And in fact, um, the, the decision to change the agenda on Friday was made after 10 o'clock on Thursday night. 
And so we didn't know. And, you know, we thought we knew what we were going to do. We thought there was an agreement on how we were going to proceed. And that, that agreement was changed after 10 o'clock on Thursday night. And um, with no transparency, certainly with no um, uh, agreement uh, with any of the other members of, of leadership in either any of the caucuses. Yeah, I mean, not that you guys need the ins and outs at all, but the first time the agreement was broken was Thursday night last week, and the second time the agreement was broken was on Tuesday. We don't need to be firing missiles at each other. We can come to agreements and pass bills. You've seen us pass bills in 10 minutes when there's an agreement, and we've done it multiple times this special session, and every single bill this special session could have and should have been that way. So the next question is from Steve Karnowski, who's asking, how do you expect the rest of the day and evening to unfold? You know, really, the ball is uh, in the Senate Republicans' court. Um, they can make a determination at this point in time whether they're going to walk out on Minnesotans, whether they're going to uh, leave early um, and, and leave the work incomplete, or whether they're going to stay you know, just because we stay in special session doesn't necessarily mean they all need to be here at the Capitol from 6 a.m. to midnight all through uh, Saturday and Sunday. So if people have some special, special Father's Day plans, they can still accommodate those, um, those things. If there are some members uh, who need to travel on family vacations or things like that, we don't need every single individual here in the building to do the work. Uh, the right thing to do is to stay in special session because... If the special session is adjourned, we have to start over. All the bills have to get reintroduced and start over. So it just prolongs the time that it takes to get to agreement. And we also know that the nature of these conversations and this process is that um, when you have momentum, you keep going. You keep pushing through till you get to the end. And to let up now, and, and, and the speaker's right, we can, and with, the, with Zoom, we can be very flexible and accommodating to make sure we have everybody available who needs to be in the conversations. But we should not let up at this point. And I can give Senator Gazelka some credit. Setting that deadline um, got everybody's butts in gear. And people have been working at a mad pace to get things done. So we are in good shape to get things completed. We just need a few more days. I think the governor actually suggested if we stayed until Tuesday, I think he suggested that yesterday. I believe if we stayed until Tuesday, we could get everything that's on the table wrapped up. If people bring a willingness to compromise to the table and not just a list of demands. The next question is from Walker Ornstein from MinPost. He's saying, can you comment on the CCAP bill that raises tuition reimbursement rates? Representative Pinto says it's a deal with the GOP some have been hesitant to put new money in the program after fraud concerns. Yeah, this was a deal with all four caucuses. Uh, Representative Mary Franson had an actually, I think, innovative idea on how to resolve the CCAP issue in a way that Republicans could live with. And I know uh, Senator Karen Housley, uh, I believe Senator Kiffmeyer, Senator Benson all had conversations with uh, Representative Pinto. And I'm sure that there was somebody representing the Senate DFL caucus, though I don't know who that was. Yes, that was an agreement between all four caucuses. The next question is from Esme Murphy. She's asking, are there any discussions about another special session and when would it be next week, next month, or do you have any optimism that something could be worked out then when nothing has been worked out this session? Well, we have a lot of hours left in the day. You have seen many uh, last days of session where a lot of things happen. And remember, midnight is arbitrary and unnecessary as a deadline. Um, so we can do a lot in the next 12 hours. I have a lot of optimism that things can get done. We really are not that far apart in so many different areas. Uh, the bonding bill, uh, the tax bill that Republicans demand in exchange for a bonding bill. Um, Representative Doubt and Governor uh, Walls have had some very promising conversations on executive authority, as far as I understand. Um, so there are, um, there are things that we can do. With regard to criminal justice reform, that'll be a very difficult negotiation, but it is a negotiation that absolutely has to begin and has to happen. And then the next question is from Theo Keith. Theo, do you wanna ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Speaker. I'm, I'm uh, wondering with respect to your comments just now that there are a lot of hours left in the day, um, your phrase of this news conference so far uh, seems to be launching missiles. Uh, and so I'm wondering, um, are there any negotiations, conversations going on right now about 
the, the police bills, I'm guessing not, uh, the bonding bill or the relief bill for the businesses in Minneapolis in general? Are there any negotiations, conversations, backroom talk? There are. My only involvement in the uh, police reform and accountability negotiations right now is my continuing offer to buy food for the eight members, uh, two from each caucus, if they can find a room and get into it and start talking to each other. Uh, earlier in the day, my offer was for donuts and coffee. At this point, it's still, you know, whatever Bite Squad delivers. It, it, apparently, it's free delivery Friday, so it makes it easier for me. So there's conversations about uh, those folks getting together, and they may even be together right now. I don't know. We've been pushing hard for that for at least the last uh, 12 to 15 hours. Um, there are continuing conversations on the uh, COVID-19 local government aid bill, and the, you know you saw that there's many items in that bill that are agreed to by uh, all caucuses. Um, there's pieces of the supplemental budget that are critically important. Senator Limmer. Um, uh, and Chair Mariani might not be agreeing on police reform right now, but before the regular session adjourned, they sent a letter signed by all four caucuses about how critical the Department of Corrections uh, supplemental funding requests are. Uh, DPS has a supplemental funding request that is very critical, especially in light of the role that they played during uh, the civil unrest. So there's a lot of conversations going on, unfortunately, mostly by text right now, but hopefully uh, the four of us will be in a room, the uh, five of us will be in a room soon. And then the next question we have is from Peter Callahan. Peter, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I do. Hi. Um, I, can you explain what the launching of missiles is? Are we just supposed to know that? Is that the, them passing their police uh, uh, reform bills? Or is that something else? I don't know. Does, uh, Ryan Winkler has been very quiet. Ryan, do you want to explain launching missiles or did Ryan have to go? Maybe oh, Ryan had to go. Sorry, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, yes, that's a phrase of art in, legis in the legislature. When you send a, a bill to the other side um, as an aggressive maneuver. Rep uh, Senator Kent? <laughs> well, well I, right. I don't need a definition of the term. I need to know what bills you consider to be missiles. I think almost everything they sent on Tuesday. I don't know if there was anything on Tuesday. I think they did send two things per agreement on Tuesday. I want to say it was Senate File 15 and Senate File 45, which are now signed into law. Well, and then I came over. I believe the missiles were the CARES Act LGA, sending that with no agreement. And then uh, I, was it five different uh, police reform and accountability type measures? And an education bill in the middle of the night that wasn't even, that was confusing on the, on the agenda on, in the Senate. And I had heard one of the missiles loaded in the launcher was uh, vouchers, but I'm not sure if they actually did send vouchers over to us or not. We don't pay a lot of attention to voucher missiles coming from the Republican-led Senate. Okay, for, the, for, for the, the record, that was pulled from the agenda because apparently they didn't even have votes in their own caucus for that one. Can I ask a follow that isn't really a follow? Are you saying nobody on this call can say whether or not there is a police accountability working group meeting right now? I cannot tell you that. I can tell you that um, I have a very long series of texts about it that uh, Chair Mariani and Chair Moran have been reaching out to the Senate to schedule something. They haven't heard anything back. Doubt would like O'Neill involved. O'Neill needs an hour to drive here. Um, there's a lot of conversations, but right now the Senate, we're getting radio silence from the Senate GOP. Okay, so the next question that we have is from John Croman. He's asking, could one of the House leaders explain what was changed in the COVID funding bill uh, and respond to minority leaders' complaint that it's deficit spending or money already spent? Sure. So when we were in the regular session, we started to spend Minnesota general fund dollars on COVID-19 response actions. Then the United States Congress sent the CARES Act, which had $1.87 billion, actually $2.1 billion for Minnesota. Some of the spending that we did is CARES Act eligible. So we can use CARES Act money to repay the general fund, and then we can use that general fund money to make expenditures that are not COVID-19 related. So uh, we're repaying ourselves from federal money to do things that we can only do with state money. So one example is the Department of Corrections deficiency. You can only do that with, um, with state general fund dollars. The Department of Public Safety deficiency, you have to use state dollars. Um, 
so what we did is we repaid the state general fund from the CARES Act in, in the bill that we just passed. And then we spent those, gen, those recently repaid general fund dollars on uh, general fund expenditures. I don't know if I made it any clearer, but feel free to unmute yourself and ask a follow-up. Okay, and then the next question we have, uh, Tim Pugmire is asking, have you given up on a bonding bill? Not at all. Our, <laughs> you know, um, Mary Murphy, Dave Senjum, Sandy Pappas, Dean Erdahl, they are like soldiers in the field. They are trudging along. They are just waiting for a word uh, from the commanders that there's a deal. And I really think that those fine uh, four individuals working with all the members of their caucuses because a bonding bill really involves everybody uh, could get us to a point where we have something to pass. I know that uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation has been engaged in the conversation and is working hard to figure out a way to get the trunk highway bonding in a manner that is pleasing to Senate Republicans and that uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation can also live with. So really extensive conversations on a bonding bill. I'm very hopeful about the bonding bill in a way I haven't been for a long time uh, because uh, Minority Leader Doubt and Governor Walls have had such good conversations in recent days and, and really both put their noses to the grindstone on how to resolve that impasse. And it looks like our last question here is from Esme again. She's asking, are you in agreement with the governor on making Juneteenth a holiday? And how do you feel about what appears to be a failure to not reach a deal on police reform on Juneteenth? Well, I think that we should pass a bill to make that a holiday today. I think all four caucuses should agree to suspend the rules. And that should be a bill that we get on the governor's desk this afternoon. I don't think there's a failure yet on police reform. I think not. I think walking out on Juneteenth is especially bad optics for the Minnesota Republican Senate. Um, and hopefully they will reverse course on that and give, give peace a chance, give us a little bit more time. Um, but the police reform and accountability issues are tough. They are complicated. They are not issues that can be resolved, can, that anybody can reasonably expect to be resolved in a week. At this point in time, major reform is called for. We're at a unique moment in history. I mean, the world has not reacted this strongly to racial justice issues since I think probably 1968. So we have to do something big and that will take time. And so I don't think Minnesotans can realistically expect before the night is out that there will be a deal on that. Um, there could be, um, but let's give it the time that it deserves and get it right. And it looks like we do actually have one more question from John. He's saying, the Senate majority has made a lot of comments about the police reform issue being more of a Minneapolis issue, that they don't want to do something that would affect all other police departments that are respected by their local communities. Any reaction? Uh, yeah, I don't live in Minneapolis. And I know in my communities, this the uh, local leaders want to make sure that there is accountability when there are performance problems in their, in their workforce, in law enforcement. Um, this is not unique to Minneapolis, and anyone who thinks it is is truly missing the the point here. Um, this is this is a, a bigger conversation, and it it does potentially affect every community across the state of Minnesota. Philando Castile was not shot to death in Minneapolis, and he was not shot to death by a Minneapolis police officer. Commissioner Harrington and Attorney General Ellison have said over and over and over again that sixty percent of the cases have been in greater Minnesota. They spent the time working. Senator Ingebrigtsen was on that panel. Representative Moran was on that panel. And after all the work that Harrington and Ellison did, they said one eye-opening thing was how much more of an issue this is in greater Minnesota than in the Twin Cities. All right, so I think that was our last question. Thank you, everybody.